Welcome to the final part of Lecture 1. In this part of this lecture, we're going to have a look, in overview, at the six steps that comprise the CFD process. Now, in future lectures, we're going to look in far more greater detail at each of these steps. Lecture 2 is going to look at steps 1, 2 and 3. Lecture 3 is going to look at steps 4, 5 and 6. But we're going to look at them all together now briefly so you can understand how the process of making and analysing a CFD model actually works. So, on my whiteboard now is step 1. Step one is really important. It's probably the most important step in the entire process. And that is to find the problem that you're solving. Now, defining the problem that you're solving doesn't involve a computer. It involves sitting down and thinking. Let's do this by means of an example. Here on my whiteboard, I've got a picture of a simple tea mixer. Now, tea mixers are typically etched onto glass chips and you can see here the scale bar is around 200 microns which is roughly the width of the horizontal channel. In operation what we do is we feed two fluids in the inlets of the branches of the top of the T. So in this case in from the top and in from the bottom. The two fluids come together and then will mix in some way shape or form along what is the horizontal passage depicted on this diagram. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask ourselves, first of all, what problem are we solving? So, are we using computational fluid dynamics to understand how the fluid mixes? Are we wanting to visualise, for example, the streamlines of the flow? Are we doing something different, though? Are we looking at two immiscible phases and trying to ask the question, how do two immiscible phases mix? in such a system, because that's a completely different problem you're trying to solve. We could, of course, be trying to say, well, actually, no, what we're interested in is a hot fluid and a cold fluid coming together, and all we're interested in is the thermal mixing. What does the heat transfer look like? We don't care about the fluid dynamics. We could be looking at mass transfer, and again, we could be looking at solutions of two different species coming in at the inlets, and then looking at how a chemical reaction might happen where the two fluids mix together. And so understanding the problem you're trying to solve as the first key step is really, really, really important. Those four different understandings that I've mentioned involve four completely different types of simulation. So once you've decided what problem you're trying to solve, the next thing to think about is, well, how is CFD going to inform that problem solving process? Can I use it to visualise something? Can I use it to calculate something? So am I going to be looking at streamlines? Am I going to be deriving, say, some sort of mixture average from the output data? Or am I doing some other data manipulation? How does CFD contribute to solving the problem? Once you understand that, then we can think about the next point. What level of detail is required to solve the problem? So if you're looking, for example, at heat transfer, do we actually need to understand the details of the flow? Or if we're looking at mass transfer and chemical reaction, do we actually need to understand what's going on at a molecular level? Or is a bulk flow approach suitable? If we're looking at just the fluid dynamics, what are the flow structures that are produced? Then again, what level of detail do we wish to see those flow structures in? High level of detail or low level of detail? Because level of detail is intimately tied into simulation size, which is intimately tied into solution time and hardware requirement. Usually, hardware requirement is going to be a constraint, and so choosing the level of detail that your simulation runs at has to be within that constraint. So the next thing we think about is, well, what's the simplest simulation we can do to yield the required level of information. Make the problem as simple as you can, but no simpler. So, for example, we might wish to exploit symmetry. We might wish to try and idealise some of the boundary conditions. We might find that we don't even need to use any numerical tools to do it. You might already have the knowledge from all your other engineering design approaches to solve the problem. Don't assume at the outset CFD is always a solution. A mistake I've seen many people make many times is to jump into a simulation when a little bit of thought and a little bit of hand calculation 
would have solved the problem instead a lot more quickly and a lot more cheaply but equally as effectively so let's assume we do need to use CFD let's assume that we've set the simulation up we've run it we've got some results how are you going to judge whether it's successful or not how are you going to validate this what are you going to do to convince yourself that what the computer is telling you is correct and moreover if it is correct how do you judge whether it's answered your problem or not how do you judge the success of the work that you've done so the first step is to have some good deep thought about what you're doing and how you're going to do it and how you're going to judge whether it's successful or not so the next step we start to think about the computer now for the example of our tea mixer we are going to generate a geometry that represents where equations are being solved we're not creating a geometry of the entire glass chip if all we're interested in is fluid flow and so the picture that I've put on the whiteboard just depicts the fluid flow paths those gray boxes the geometry just depict the fluid inlets the two fluid inlets the mixing arm and the fluid outlet so key learning point only put geometry where you're solving equations now can you get away with a two-dimensional simulation in the case of our tea mixer I'd suggest you can't because you've got an inherently three-dimensional problem we can however so long as the flow inlets are balanced use symmetry and we can use symmetry to simplify the problem reduce its scale reduce its hardware requirement increase its solution time so appropriate use of symmetry is really really vital it speeds everything up don't go for a full 3d simulation if you can get away by using planes of symmetry to cut your geometry down to something simpler now when you come to create geometries usually I say usually you'll have a graphical tool to do it within ANSYS Fluence you've got design modeler which is effectively a CAD package you can of course work directly from existing CAD files we're not going to be covering that in this course but you need to be aware of that fact in other codes and open foam is a very good example of this you may not necessarily have a graphical tool to use you'll need to define your geometry in a text file and so you'll need to sketch it out on some graph paper figure out the coordinates of your vertices how your vertices connect together and then input it in a certain particular format such that the computer understands your geometry so second step geometry creation only create geometry where you're solving equations third step is within that geometry tell the computer exactly where to solve equations and this is the generation of a calculation mesh the picture that I've put on the whiteboard now shows your geometry subdivided into lots and lots and lots of regularly shaped boxes it's at the corners and at the edges and at the centers of these boxes that the equations of fluid flow will be solved so because the solution process is so inherently tied to the mesh spend time generating a good mesh it's really 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 critical time generating a mesh is time well spent because a bad mesh simply won't solve now we'll be talking a lot more about this in lecture two again usually you will have a graphical tool to define where your mesh goes again in some packages you'll still need to use a text file input and again that's the difference between something like ANSYS and open phone putting mesh where there are gradients is the mantra you need to think about if I've got a gradient I need more mesh if I've got a strong shear rate I need more mesh if I've got a high thermal gradient I need more mesh because that is where all your parameters that your simulation is calculating change fastest and so more information is required to resolve those in a level of detail that is sufficient and fit for purpose when you're generating mesh typically within some packages you'll also be grouping together boundaries of the same nature you won't be saying what those boundaries are at the moment but you will be for example saying well all these boundaries are walls or all these boundaries will be defined as walls later on this boundary is going to be defined as an outlet later on these boundaries might be defined as inlets later on so that brings us very neatly to our fourth step which is defining what your boundary conditions are 
what the physics is that you're trying to solve, and what physical properties are taken by the fluids that you are using within the simulation. And so what we find is that those boundary groups that we've already defined now get assigned a meaning. So for example, all those surfaces that represent a solid wall within our physical geometry may be applied a no-slip boundary condition. Or we may have an inlet being defined as a constant volumetric flow rate boundary condition or an outlet being a constant pressure boundary condition. The exact mathematical nature of the boundary condition is very important to understand because it has a very strong effect on the results of your simulation. More details of that in lecture three. We also get an opportunity now to define which transport equations we're going to be using and any other models, for example turbulence models, that we may need to incorporate. We also define the nature of the numerical algorithms and the precision to which they are solved. So, once we've defined all this, we can go ahead and invoke the solver that actually solves the equations numerically. Hopefully, they will solve. And the graph that I've put on this board shows what's termed a residual decreasing. That is to say, as you iterate through a solution, each solution gets more and more and more like the next one. And therefore, the numerical error between solutions has been reduced to an overall minimum. When that numerical error falls below a certain criteria, your simulation is deemed to be converged. So, once your simulation has converged, you may wish then to check it. And again, back to our main mantra, validation, validation, validation. You can produce lots of pretty pictures using computational fluid dynamics, hence its acronym Colors for Directors, as illustrated on the board here. But what we need to convince ourselves of is whether or not that actually resembles physical reality. And so we can extract data from our simulation, and because we know what it is we're trying to do with our simulation, we can extract the appropriate data. We can then look in literature or do some experiments and see how well the prediction and the real world compare. And hopefully they will. If they don't, we need to radically rethink our model and check very carefully our experiments. Once you've got validation, you can then start to use the model for engineering design purposes. So we have these six steps. We have def problem definition, thinking, creating a geometry, creating a calculation mesh, defining your boundary conditions, solving your problem, and validating your model. So you're now ready to go and start your first assignment. Your first assignment is ready on Moodle. It's a self-study assignment, and I've given you some very, very detailed instructions on how to go about this work. So please follow the assignment instructions closely and please only submit what is asked for. I'm, I'm going to be really strict on this. Please only submit what's asked for. I'm not looking for a great big report. I'm just looking for precisely what is specified in your assignment handout, please. There will be some demonstration sessions available for you and I've already detailed what these arrangements will be in the introductory lecture to this course. So, a few key points for you. The first and foremost thing you need to do is understand the problem you're solving. Ask yourself critically, do I even need to use a computer to solve this problem adequately? If you don't, don't. If you do, then your next step is to create the geometry where your equations are being solved, not the geometry necessarily that you see physically in front of you. We then create a calculation mesh. Remember, time spent creating a good mesh, and we'll talk in a future lecture about what a good mesh is, is time very well spent. You then define your boundary conditions. You define your physical properties. You define your transport models, and you define all the other data required to start your simulation. You then run the chosen solver, and you hope that it converges. Sometimes this can take quite a long time. You will then validate your model. Remember, validation, validation, validation. And then do something with your results that contributes towards solving that problem you defined in step one. 